So Paul, we've seen that a anything that emits light can have this nice black body. And depending on a non-opaque thing, a gas, we can see very specific colors of light or these emission line features, which is super helpful, obviously. Why though? Like, it does, does it does it randomly happen? Yeah, I mean, for most of the nineteenth century, people knew it happened. They could see the spectrum, but they had no idea why. Why would, why would neon, for example, emit at this wavelength and not any other wavelength? Not a wavelength one percent more or one percent less? Yeah. Why? Why is it like these weird spacings and these weird levels? Now, this has got to have something to do with the atoms. Okay. So an atom is a nucleus of protons and neutrons with electrons spinning around it. And, and so often we have four of each here. Yep. So. We kind of imagine what's happening is you must be losing energy in the atom to radiate the energy in the emission line. Yeah, that energy has to come from somewhere. Yep. So somehow there's going to be the electrons spinning around here which lose energy, and that energy gets turned into light that flies away into space. So because for some reason these electrons lose this energy, it's transferred into light that we see. But why do they lose energy in the first place? Well, the other puzzle is why, I mean, you could lose energy by spiraling in towards the center. Okay, yep. Uh, it's like in our solar system. If a planet moves closer to the sun, it's going to lose energy. That's right. So if an electron spiraled in close, it would lose energy. But the question is, why would it only lose particular amounts? Yeah, that's true, right? Because wouldn't it either be like a gradual process or be half and a quarter and an eighth or something like that? Yeah, you'd imagine as it's lost energy, it would go lose energy bit by bit by bit and could have any amount. So you have a spectrum that's like a continuum all over the way. But it seems that it only ever jumps from one level to the next rather than moving steadily from anything. And, and every atom jumps different corresponding levels. Which is a bit weird. When, why would it have energy number one, energy number two, but never energy one and a half? Yeah. So, so there clearly has to be something going on with the way the electrons and atoms are actually physically moving and, let's say, operating. And this is now there is an, an, an analog for sound waves. Uh, because if you okay. do something like clapping, yep. um, that's emitting sound at a whole range of frequencies. Yep. But if you have like um, singing la 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 or whatever it might be, then it's only putting out particular frequencies, the notes. Okay, that's right. So it's transferring very specific wavelengths of sound in this case. So an emission line spectrum is kind of like musical sound rather than noise. Okay, so so musical so sound has got particular uh, wavelengths, whereas noise <laughs> is... <laughs> All across the spectrum. So, so the emission lines are the, the beautiful parts of light, is what you're saying. That's indeed what I'm saying. And well, let's imagine if you have a musical instrument. Yep. So here's my guitar, and when you pluck the string, you get a note. That's right, and it slowly tapers off as that yep. uh, energy is transferred. Now I recorded that note, and here is what the waveform looks like, or a little bit of it. So it's a little bit louder. And then it decreases and decreases, but as it decreases, the wavelengths get a little bit longer. Well, this is the air pressure, and yep. this is only like a millisecond worth of it, so yep. it's um, the whole amplitude gets smaller as it goes on. Yep. What you can do is you can do a, a mathematical technique of spectrum analysis, technically a Fourier transform on this, and break this down into its component frequencies. And what you see is that, in this particular case, there's a lot of power at this frequency, which is about 100 hertz, yep. and that frequency, which is about double it, and other things like this. So this is actually looking like an emission line spectrum. There's yeah, a lot of, of does. sound at certain frequencies, but and not, not at very all. much at others. That's right. This is a logarithmic scale, so it doesn't look that different from here, but actually this is like thousands of times different in energy. So it's actually very much like the emission line spectrum we were looking at for hydrogen earlier. And, and there's a little bit of really thin ones, but not a whole lot. Yeah, and what's happening here is that You've got the string that's, spring, the string that's vibrating, yep. and it can't vibrate. It's fixed at both ends. Yeah, that's right. So it can't, it can't just move or fly off. It physically has to stay there. So it can oscillate like this, which is yep. where it's fixed at both ends and vibrating the most in the middle. Yep. Or it can be fixed at both ends and in the middle, but vibrate like this. Or it can vibrate three times. But there's going to be a certain integer number of oscillations up and down it. Okay. Where you can't have... So you can have this or that, but you can't have something halfway between the two because then the ends would not be fixed. Yeah, okay, all right, I see what you're saying. So it's kind of like there, you couldn't just invisibly make it somewhere else and still work. Yeah, so if you get a sound wave and it's fixed at both ends, say by being a guitar string or a violin string yes. or the vocal cords, mm -hmm. or if you have a column of air like in a wind instrument or an organ, which is maybe fixed at one end and open at the other or fixed at both ends, then instead of getting every frequency, you only get the frequencies which allow it to the right wavelengths to be fixed at both ends. Oh, okay. So it's really determined on 
essentially how it's well, made in this case or physically what's controlling it. Yeah. So in fact, the same thing is happening for atoms. So it's like something is kind of fixing it to only move in specific ways. In our previous picture, we kind of imagined electrons as like little billiard balls flying around. But yep. in fact, and this is the whole theory of quantum mechanics, electrons can behave like waves. Yep. Now, we're not going to go into wave particle <laughs> duality because that would be a whole other course by itself. But they are, do act as probability waves, quantum right. mechanical waves, Schrodinger waves, um, and they're trapped inside the atom. And just like with our guitar string, they can't just move any other random integer or half integer that they want. Yeah, and it's even more complicated because it's actually they're trapped in a three-dimensional yes. thing rather than a one-dimensional string. But there are certain patterns they can have. They can have the maximum at the middle and going down the outside, or they can have a maximum and a minimum. Or, uh, but of course, they can do it in 3D, so they can have the maximum and minimum in different directions. Yeah. And it all becomes a bit complicated. But these are the basic patterns you can get. There's the equation for those who like it. Um, and so you can have this one or this one, but you can't have something halfway between the two. Because, because it wouldn't be zero at the edges. It's, that's it's, right, you can't have a two and a half somewhere. Yeah, so the fact that electrons act like waves, which is weirdo quantum mechanical stuff, and they're trapped, means that they can't have any wavelength they like. And for electrons, just like for light, the wavelength determines the energy. The shorter yeah. the wavelength, the higher the energy. So this means that the electrons in an atom can only have certain energy levels, which is something you may remember from chemistry That's at right. school. And those energy levels then have to correspond to a certain wavelength because that is the energy it's going to be emitting at. Yeah.